Welcome to Paper Mill Playhouse and Babbling by the Brook. I'm Mark Hobie, Producing Artistic Director. You know, previously on this series, we've talked about new musicals that have had their premiere right here at Paper Mill. Today, I'm so excited to talk about a new show that's still in development. It's called It's Kind of a Funny Story. It was based on a novel and then became a film. And now, the multi-talented team of Alex Brightman and Drew Gasparini are writing the musical version for the stage, and Paper Mill is going along for the ride. Please help me welcome now Drew Gasparini and Alex Brighton. Hey guys, thanks for joining me here today. It is great to see both of you. Yeah. Hi. Hey. <laughs> I think the, the last time we were together was in a bar. Remember bars? Yeah. Um, right at the Intercontinental Hotel. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Uh, a great place at a high great top great place table. great place at a high top table drinking some i think drew i think you were drinking some fancy drinks i that, maybe a martini that sounds uh, like something i might have had i, I don't know. drink <laughs> no <laughs> not since eh, a couple minutes ago <laughs> but anyway it's good to have you here and to chat with you and you know drew obviously we know you're award-winning composer and working on a million projects and Alex, you know, you're from School of Rock um, and most recently Beetlejuice. But um, the way I met you together was actually in the studio for this project you're working on, a new musical of, uh, for uh, a movie, It's Kind of a Funny Story. Yes. And, oh, there you go. And it's also a novel. But I can't even remember who invited me to that reading. I went to a reading of It's Kind of a Funny Story. And for me, it was kind of a last minute. Uh, I didn't know if I was gonna be able to make it. And um, the last minute my schedule changed and I showed up at, uh, you know, Duke 42, the studios there. Yeah, um, and I, I, to be completely honest, I had no idea what I was seeing. And um, Drew, you referenced the novel. And of course there was a film that I learned about later. But, um, which my son will never forgive me. He's like, that's my favorite movie. And why did you take <laughs> me to that reading? Amazing. <laughs> right? I told you that. But how did you guys meet as creative team? And then how did you land on this project? I, uh, Alex and I met, uh, I mean, years and years. Years be not years and years, but maybe a year or two before we actually became creatively uh, involved. We were just best friends and palling around and hanging out, and we started collaborating. And honestly, I'm gonna really thumb this. I'm gonna give you a real uh, cut down version of this. But Universal came. I don't know how word got out that Alex and I were working together. That's very true. I honestly don't know how Universal. I don't either. That we were working together, but they asked us to submit material for uh, another adaptation that they were working on um, and we'd never written a song together and they were looking for like a music lyric team and typically I do music and lyrics and Alex does book uh, and we wrote a song together we're like all right let's go for it we wrote a song they really liked the song they didn't go with us on this certain project but they approached us and said since we keep going back to your song and listening to it what do you guys want to do and we went through the Universal movie catalog and we saw this title that spoke, we saw a bunch of other silly titles. Like, I think we were talking kind of seriously about King Ralph. King Ralph. <laughs> for a minute. Uh, but we landed on this. And when we told uh, Chris Hertzberger at Universal, who's producing this, that this was an interesting choice for us. He kind of said like, we're really glad you chose that because we were also leading toward this project as well. They, they seemed, Chris seemed as if he was sort of waiting for someone to approach this source material because it, it does speak musical yes. language so well. And what we did, we, we, um, we were out with them trying to pitch the idea of as musical, not knowing we sort of already had it, you know, that we already sort of had won by picking it. We had the novel and the first line of the novel um, I, I said, you know, the, the old cliche in musicals is why do we sing in a musical? It's because the emotions are so high, we can't speak anymore. We have to sing. And I think that's great. I love that kind of cliche. I love it. And, and I said, that's, so that's the trope. That's the cliche. I said, look at the first line of this book. 
And the first line of the book is, it's so hard to talk when you want to kill yourself. And the stakes couldn't start any higher, and it drives straight into a musical thought. And so, and, the, and that had him sold, and it had us sold too. Yeah. And you obviously knew the film, right? Yeah. Yes. Both had seen it and loved it separately together, whatever. Yeah. Separately, I think. I mean, I think it was more like we had both seen it, it uh, you know, at some point in our lives, and it speaks to a very specific, I think it's for everybody, but it speaks to a very specific mind um, that grew up in the time. Ned Vizzini, you know, who wrote it was also of a certain age that, you know, we sort of lived through, you know, yeah. the, um, you know, and it speaks a very specific language that we speak very well. And um, so we were uh, drawn to it, I think, even before we were drawn to it. It is something that did stick in my memory as yeah. something that was very magical as a film. And I had actually never read the novel until we came across this. And so when I read the novel, I, I realized how much was missing, not missing, just left out of the film for good reason, because it's a film, and how much could be done from the novel on stage. So just for anybody who's not familiar, and now I have to give a big shout out to Chris Hertzberg because he's the one who invited me, now I remember, <laughs> and Mo Cunningham, right? It's all coming back. Yeah. Um, but it was true that I wasn't sure I was gonna make it, and I, it was the last minute my plans changed and I was in New York and I said, I'll just, I'll jump over and I'll go. Um, but uh, so give, give us a, just a, a synopsis for anybody who's not familiar with the novel or the film, you know, what the story is. Sure. Um, in brief, because it's about a lot of things, it is about a high schooler uh, who is, um, who's dealing with a lot. He's got a lot on his shoulders and a lot on his mind um, and thinks that everything is wrong with him and thinks that he it, it, something is wrong with him and he can't figure out what it is. And, and rather than try and figure it out, we meet him at sort of a rock bottom where he is about to jump off the Brooklyn Bridge to commit suicide. And through certain um, mechanisms of grief and regret and possible even optimism, he decides not to, and to check himself into a psychiatric ward uh, for the week, because he always knows that there's the option. You know, so why not see what's wrong with me before I, I take the next te step or leap? Um, and in there, he realizes after meeting so many amazing people who share a lot of the anxieties and depressions and um, uh, mindsets that he does, he sort of realizes along the way that there's nothing wrong with him. Um, there's something wrong with everybody. <laughs> and right. if there's something wrong with everybody, then everyone's okay. Then you're part of a larger majority than you thought. Yeah. And he comes out with some knowledge of like, you know, stakes are high, yes. But life, that does not mean life is not worth living. It means life is worth living. It means life is worth living, in fact. Yeah. And it's fascinating because I remember very obviously the, the show and the reading, which by the way, if I'm not mistaken, was the first reading of your, the material you'd ever done. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have prior, to say, prior to the reading, we'd only done one uh, concert that's you know, kind of cemented on YouTube now, but yeah, that was the first developmental reading. It was at 54 Below, that concert. Yes. Because yes. I was, was looking at the YouTube clips last night. Um, the music's <laughs> very good. It's catchy Thanks. and engaging, but um, you're right. Like the show opens and the, 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 even at the reading, you paint the picture that there's this teenager on the Brooklyn Bridge ready to jump off and end it all. And you think, wow, this is, you know, um, the beginning of a musical. Right. And, uh, yeah. You know, a little crazy. And then I didn't even know at that time that it was a novel. Right. And that unfortunately the author actually succumbed and uh you know we lost him to suicide yeah. yes so it's after the novel came out yeah say that again a few years after the novel came out he, he unfortunately uh committed suicide so he didn't even he wasn't even around long enough to see the uh the film version no I think I, that's i think i think he was yes he was i think it was 2013 or 2014 that he did it and the movie came out in 2010. i mean so sad to lose a creative talent like that and obviously someone struggling with mental illness which is a theme of what this piece is all about right right and yeah. it's a great also by the way it's a great um 
you know, sort of thing to think about is that, that, that we always think about, which is yes, you know, he, people can work through their grief, work through their anxieties, work through their depression in certain ways. Ned Vizzini, the author of this book and many others, um, worked his way through it. I mean, he, he got it out of his system and yet the ongoing anxiety and depression, it, it, got, it got to him enough in a way that he wanted to end it. So we do explore you know, beyond the book, which I think is why we wanted to do this musical and beyond the movie, we explore the ongoing nature of something rather than saying, you know, having sort of that happy, like I'm fixed happy ending, yes. which we didn't absolutely didn't want to put out there. Um, something that is, I'm not better, but I'm getting there. And I think that is something that is wholly optimistic, but I think even more so realistic. The, the, the admittance of uh, the perpetual work in progress. He really voiced that idea. And I think it's something, sorry, that's New York outside my window. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think that's something that now and more and more nowadays is starting to kind of unearth itself. And we're starting to see people come to terms with the fact that, oh, it's okay to admit some of these shortcomings because by and large, there is some common denominator with that. And what I, what really, I think, if you don't mind me saying this, and I think Alex agrees with me, is like what really sets us apart because there are a few musicals that have to do with um, navigating mental illness, is this is through the lens of one person, but what Ned Vizzini really, really did well was paint the picture of this island of misfit toys at the psych ward that he checks himself into. And it, and it creates this idea of community that sometimes when you watch the stories of someone dealing with anxiety or depression, it really seems like the man is the island, when in truth you are super duper connected and not by very much at all to separate you. So I think Ned Vizzini did a really good job. And I'm sorry, I'm rambling here, but since we're on the topic of Ned Vizzini, one of the biggest sadnesses with his passing is he will never get to see the mark he's had in musical theater, period, because Be More Chill was kind of a phenomenon the way that it emerged and the way it got to Broadway, that story was so amazing. And to see his work kind of live out in, a, in another medium. And now with Funny Story, and we get messages all the time, yeah. all the time from those YouTube videos, just thanking us for continuing to tell his story. So it's very sad that he's not here to see this because I really think his stories and the way he told them is gonna leave a really big impact in the musical theater world. What, and what you're saying is so important because the beauty is that however he struggled, he's still um, helping people through his art. And the other thing I think thematically that's so strong about this piece is it's told through the eyes of a teenager, right? A young person, which is, you know, having raised two teenagers myself and having been a teenager at one point, which is hard to remember. <laughs> but, um, you know, we all struggle at that moment you know, in adolescence of, I'm not good enough. Uh, there's something wrong with me. I'm not like other people. And I think, uh, you know, some people don't get past that point. You know, it's, it's exactly right. And I think that there's a thing, it's funny. You're, I think you're saying that Drew and I, and myself included, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of uh, writers tend to write about a similar theme. And I think across the board, there is this sort of zooming out um, theme, like this aspect of like, the stakes are high, but if you were to just zoom out even an inch, you'd realize that, um, for lack of a better term, and I have used this term before, that while you may be the star of your own story, you have to remember, and what's great and what should be feel very comfortable and make you feel better, is you are an extra in a lot of people's lives, and that should take the pressure off. Right. And I and think that that's a story we're trying to tell here with Craig, is that but one of the things he learns um, you know, through his journey in the psych ward is, Yes, he, that your problems are valid. Your anxieties are valid. Your depression is valid, but you're not the only one. And that's a good thing. I think you're exactly right. The idea that, and I think that, you know, I think the topic of mental illness and that it were, it's not that long ago that it was taboo. Sure. To even speak right. about it, right? And now there are commercials on TV about all kinds of medication and procedures, just trying to get the word out to say, um, to, to, D, uh, stereotypes. What's the word I'm looking for? Stigmatize. Yeah, destigmatize. Exactly the whole the whole situation, and um, and more people who aren't diagnosed still struggle with a lot of these issues. 
Absolutely. So I think it's great that it's out in the world. I think it's even better that you're writing a musical about it <laughs> because that's a medium that can speak to a lot of people. And what's also great, because we're talking about a lot of heavy stuff here, is it's hilarious. Oh, thanks. It, I mean, come on. It, the, the uh, that's, way, I'm still saying thanks. Thank you. It's very nice. That's very nice of you to say. It well, is that, great. That's a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> a big I just, one. I, I was moved. I laughed. I I, I, you know, I felt so much for the characters in the story, um, but the way it's told is is very uh, funny, and I don't want to say lighthearted because there's serious subjects in there, but it's um, a lot more palatable to understand and to to empathize with what's happening. One of the things. Oh, I'm sorry. You go ahead, Drew. Well, I was just going to pay you a compliment. Actually, it was. I think a lot. Oh, of go right ahead. Go right ahead. <laughs> Uh, Ned Vizzini does it very well in the, in the, uh, the, I forgot what I was going to say, Alex, go for it. <laughs> okay, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just uh, pretend that it was a great compliment. Thank you, Drew. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get it back because it was a compliment, <laughs> I promise. I, what, I, I, what I find to be funny um, is uh, I think self-deprecation gets a bad rap. Um, and I think that when we self-deprecate, we are at our most funny, in my opinion. I think that's where good comedy comes from. That's where some of my favorite comedians come from, is poking fun at themselves, because that is, that is the thing that brings people together. It's, it's, it's weird if, if somebody is out there blaming everyone else and never looking inward. So I think one of the things we found, like the novel, because the novel is narrated in first person, yes. um, is that we break the fourth wall um, in a way that isn't Craig talking to the audience necessarily, but in our, our goal with this is that Craig is talking to whoever will listen is the idea, is the sort of the convention we've put out there, is that if, if one person's out there or if it's an audience of 1200 people, it's whoever will listen, he's willing to speak to you. And he's going to share his candid thoughts, he's going to share his asides, he's going to share very vulnerable thoughts because they're like your thoughts and like your own brain, you're always there for whatever happens. And I think that's very scary for some people. Whatever you're going to go through, you'll be there to see it. You know, and I find that to be terrifying and wonderful all at the same time, that whatever happens in your life, you have a front row seat to it. So it was fun, I think, to, take, to put this as a musical because it is exactly that. You are getting a literal front row seat to somebody's psyche. And I find that to be, I find that to be fascinating. I, can, I still find it to be fascinating the more we rewrite it, that we are able to sort of, the, psych, the cyclical nature of, you getting to watch someone's psyche while thinking about your own psyche while watching somebody else's. I just think there's something fascinating about that and only something you can do in a theater. Right, and just speaking of some of those things only you would do in a theater or could do in a theater. I do remember, because um, his family plays a big part in it too, right? Yeah, sure. His father, mother, and um, one of the conventions of readings is that we consolidate things, we don't do dance numbers, you know, we talk about things we say, and then there's a big set change and we all, <laughs> and sometimes we double and triple cast actors um, just to economize and get the show up on its feet. So I do remember the moment that um, his, he has a scene with his family um, and then all of a sudden he's in the psych ward and the therapist comes in and it was the same actress who played his mother. Yes. Like, oh, I see they're economizing, but that was not true. No. It's a purposeful thing with, with his parents, how they take on these other identities, not only his mother as the therapist, but the role of his father. Yes. Who, plays, who plays sort of um, anxiety incarnate. Um, yeah. It's a character we, we created specifically, kind of bred out of the book slightly. There is, there is like a, you know, hints of it here and there. Um, it's referenced in the movie. And we sort of have, you know, uh, it was, it's a character we created called the general, um, which is short for general anxiety. Um, but he actually is sort of in functions as a war general in Craig's head, not unlike um, Full Metal Jacket, you know. Sorry, right. Uh, and so that is purposeful. And I think that is fun, especially if you are questioning your own self about, am I crazy? Because that is his big question. And he realizes he's asking the wrong question by the end. But, um, you know, am I crazy? And he keeps kind of getting the, the answer yes for quite a while, which is, which is interesting. Um, and, you know, the whole... My, your mom is your therapist couldn't be more Freudian. And I just loved the idea of, of playing into it, especially since we had the access to the fourth wall to sort of when the therapist turns around, he sort of turns to the audience and goes, you see her too, right? 
<laughs> so I think I love that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff would tickle me in a theater. And so I, I enjoyed writing that kind of stuff. It's a, um, it's a great concept, but it, it works so beautifully for the talented actors who are playing more than one part in his life. Yeah. Yeah. Happens in your head and sometimes in real life. Yeah. Um, I remembered the compliment I wanted to pay Alex. So when you, when we edit this together, we'll splice this into the <laughs> moment. Uh, but I was going to say about this being a taboo subject and also finding the humor in something that's so heavy and dark is this is where Alex and I, I think, bounce off each other very well. Uh, he, because I, I, like a suction cup onto him. He's got this gift that I latch onto, which is taking something that you almost shouldn't talk about. He's like a Don Rickles in this sense, but you can make it, you can make it palatable. You can make some of the things that Beetlejuice says, and this is his actor writer's brain, which are always kind of uh, tied together and functioning as one. He's a crass MF on that stage. And Alex Brightman made him a completely lovable guy. And he's always had this gift to make the most despicable or the darkest or the most horrendous parts of life or character into something that isn't so scary for anybody who hasn't really seen that stuff in this context before. So I just wanted to say that the humor and everything, all the credit goes to Alex when it comes to that. Because oh. the, songs, the songs, well, there's this, there's this yin and yang in the show where there's a lot of humor in the show and that's really Alex's uh, for uh, Forte and he kills it in this and then there's this really emotional thread that's kind of put together with the music and the the combination of the two I think is is another reason why this musical feels palatable even though it's in this dark world anyway that was your big compliment buddy I just want well, to I'm say glad, I'm glad, you got a superpower glad we got back to it because I, that's exactly what we were talking about this kind of dark heavy subject that was taboo not that long ago is now a subject of conversation and totally easy. I mean, there's moments in it in, in the evening that are challenging to accept, but it's, they're easier to accept in the way that they are um, balanced. The, the novel in the back, you know how novels have reviews and they have like they'll post sort of a pull quote from a review. One of the things that struck me and <clears throat> something I wanted to honor um, in the musical a lot was this quote, and, it, and I believe this is the direct quote, is, is, the le is the least depressing story about depression? A book about depression that's not the least bit depressing. That's right, and I love that. I just love the idea that yes, fact, yeah, fact, if you look at the facts and you look at the words, yes, it is about this subject. However, it is, there are ways to talk about it that make it less taboo and that make it more universal and make it more, it's the idea of laughing in the face of death. I mean, that is why we laugh is because if we didn't laugh, to quote Hedwig in The Angry Inch, we'd cry. <laughs> right. well, we, can, we can post that quote on one of those long sides under the marquee. Great. You know, uh, only we'll just change. You'll feel from other musicals. <laughs> our show. We'll, we'll change novel to musical. Yeah, <laughs> great. If I were a rich man, it's yeah. kind of a funny story. Yeah. Um, but his family dynamics are so interesting too, because he has the young sister who's such a go-getter, right? She's like a whiz. Um, and you, you can just see that whole family dynamic um, that plays out, I'm sure, in many, many families, including my own. Um, sure. uh, the stuff that he has to deal with, the dad thing is, I thought that was such a brilliant thing to um, humanize the anxiety in this drill sergeant kind of way, <laughs> because that's who I grew up with. My dad was that guy. Um, you know, I think you're the only one that had that. <laughs> right, and how that affects you, and how you have to deal with it, right? Right. Well, I also, the, I'm sorry, the, I think that one of the things that the, the family dynamic and also he, you know, kind of balloons out to his friends and then even balloons out further to the, even the new friends he meets in the psych ward is that right. through Craig's eyes, and, and I, I can say this as somebody who suffers from anxiety and depression, and I know Drew um, agrees with me on this because we've talked about it. When you are going through something and you're at a pretty bad part of it, you tend to believe or just know that everyone around you but you is thriving. And that is something that is so hard to deal with sometimes. And, and it doesn't matter what great heights you've reached or where you are. It doesn't matter. It's what Jim Carrey says. I wish everybody had a million dollars so that he, they could see it's not going to solve their problems. Right. Is, is, um, that's exactly right. And so I, that, that family dynamic and when you see him with his friends, from the audience too. The audience is seeing what looks like, wow, yeah, everyone around Craig is really thriving, but it's because we are watching this through the lens of somebody who's suffering. Right, yeah. And I think, I think that's a big thing in, 
in every family, right? They always say you can't compare one kid to the other, <laughs> but they're already comparing each other against <laughs> their siblings. Yeah. And I always, I always, I always fear for parents of like multiples, twins, triplets, like how do you deal with that? Right. But then I also relate that also to life as an artist in the theater, right? Sure. People are always like, well, what did you just do? What show are you in? What are you working on? doesn't matter what that huge list of credits that got you to this point. So we're all, that's what I think is so relatable about this story, not just about a teenager struggling with adolescence and depression. It's something we all live through. And like you said, it's a journey. We almost never get through it, right? We don't. And I think that one of the things Craig's, Craig, Craig knows, but then learns. I think inherently everyone knows this, but they want to push it away because it, it is, it's much more fun to, sometimes it is much more fun to have the journey there rather than just accept it at face value in the front, is life expects a lot of you. Yeah. And that's something nobody is exempt from. And it, it, a lot of the people, I'm, I'm speaking about myself and I have spoken to others, but you know, when you accept that, it's either going to get much harder or it gets easier, but either way, it's still stressful. And right. so this story spoke to both Drew and I because we both have anxiety and depression and we both have our different levers of how we you know, take care of it in certain ways with, with failure and success in, in tandem. Um, and I just think that accept, that, that knowledge of you're not, a, you're not crazy and you're not alone mm -hmm. can take the pressure off of this big life thing that yeah. does, in fact, expect a ton out of you. Yeah. And I think as young people, um, a lot of us grow up with uh, parents that are, you know, expect a lot of you for whatever reason, their background. If you're successful, they expect more success. If you're not successful, why aren't you successful? Um, so I think it's interesting because I want to go in the psych ward that the people that he finds in there and unlikely support systems, right? <laughs> Um, people who are not like him, the adolescent ward is shut down. He has to go into the, uh, you know, the adult ward, which just that thought alone is scary for a lot of people, right? Right. Um, but he finds some unlikely allies in there and learns from them and teaches them. But talk a little bit about those people that become his friends, really, right? Yeah. Drew? Uh, sure. I mean, the, I think the, the most significant one, at least in our adaptation of this story, is a character named Bobby. And in the movie, he's portrayed by uh, Zach Galifianakis. And I think Zach did a good job. And uh, not, I think that he did a fine job. You reference him by name. I just love that you're like, my yeah. friend Zach. Uh, big Z. Yeah. So, uh, but Bobby, what's interesting about Bobby to me, uh, especially in how we're kind of doing this, is the, the similarities that Bobby finds in Craig, that he and Craig share. Mm -hmm. I think it takes Craig a few steps behind Bobby. I think Bobby clocks it and kind of says, I see a lot of what I used to have in this kid. Like, I lost my pilot light where this kid is on fire. A little bit and I think there's there's that dynamic that's really interesting and the fun thing about Bobby is we don't really know what his issue is like what the defining thing is that brought him to uh, the psych ward but then there are characters like Humble who is a conspiracy theorist and uh, has a schizophrenia and uh, JC who is bipolar and transgender and going through uh, a lot of uh, emotional and internal changes and kind of navigating that whole situation. And um, yeah, I'm missing a few other people. Well, th yeah, there's, I mean, Craig's roommate is, is a, a one that is an interesting sort of thing that actually, I, I think we're, we're, it's, you know, it's, it's always funny when you're developing a musical where like things that you, the thing I'm going to talk about right now is either going to be like really developed or it's going to be gone by the time this is, you know, yeah. Aaron. Um, but his roommate is an Egyptian man named Muktada who speaks in grunts. I mean, he, that, and so you get, you run the gamut, you run the spectrum, no pun intended, at, at the psych ward of people who, if you passed on the street, you'd go, there's nothing wrong with that person. But then if you passed this person on the street, you'd go, that person belongs in a psych ward. And so you get, you really, I think we, we do, we paint a broad spectrum of the, the, the people that belong in a psych ward versus the, you know, the Craig of it all who comes in and basically goes, well, I'm not like any of you in the beginning. Like yeah. I knew, I, I thought something was wrong with me, but I'm not like any of you until, you know, an hour and a half later, 
uh, we, we've spent five days in the psych ward and Craig finds more similarity in these people than he's found in anybody he's ever met. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's true uh, that he like, go, makes a 180 um, sort of uh, rethinks his decision. Sure. He wants to yeah. get out immediately and then realizes he can't get out. Has right. to spend his time. Um, and the Bobby thing is so interesting because he becomes uh, you, kind of a mentor you know, he, he feels like a permanent resident of this psych ward, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and almost, uh, there's a sense that he's sort of given up that he will be able to assimilate back into society. But he wants to pass whatever's left of his spirit onto Craig so that, you know, Craig yeah. can go out and be successful in the world. And then um, Craig seems to enlighten, or I always think of, um, Muktada, what's his name? Muktada, yeah. Muktada, right? I think of him as nonverbal until the end when it's their relationship that he actually comes out of his shell, right? Sure. I mean, someone giving any, you know, all it took and not, not to say again, like the one thing we are trying not to do with this musical is find the cure. It's not a thing, we are not trying to cure anything. So the thing that breaks him out of his shell for the moment is that Craig decided to give him the time of day. Right. Um, and that he didn't treat him like a patient, treated him like a friend and, and or, or tried, you know, at least put himself out there. Um, the one person we're forgetting is Noel. No, well, I wanted to bring that up. Um, I... And so what a great segue. Um, Noel is the, is the, the, I mean, big conduit to, for on both sides of the outside world. For her, Craig is this sort of like uh, wire to the outside world that she's missed. I mean, she's been in there not very long, but long enough for where it's a, a pretty per semi-permanent stay. Um, and mm -hmm. she has, uh, you know, problems of her own that are not necessarily self-generated. Um, she tells a story about sort of being uh, groomed and abused by a stepfather um, to the point of her trying to make herself ugly by cutting her face with scissors so that he wouldn't uh, abuse her anymore. Um, and so the idea of, I mean, couldn't be a better example of winning a battle and losing the war type type situation and for Craig it really gives him this sort of like there's someone like me in here yeah. and that I think is the big like I think if I was Craig I would be going into this place thinking I'm going to be the youngest by 40 years because only older people get you know whatever right. and and to see that I think really rocks Craig and and the one thing we're also trying to stay away from is that you know we're trying to tell a story about anxiety depression hope uh, uh, you know and, and, and realism. And the one thing we definitely don't want to get into is, is romance. I think that there, you know, one of the things the movie did sort of okay, I, 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 think, the, I think the one thing I, I would have a, a little gripe with with the movie, which I loved, was that they sort of t t tipped, they teetered into a possible what would be maybe a romantic situation. Right. Um, right. And I think what's more important, for the musical at least, because I think it worked okay in the movie, for our sake, is that this is a it's a, first of all, it's not even about this, but their story is a friendship story, a burgeoning friendship based on something very similar that they share. Right. Um, hers, she wears literally on her face. His, he wears on his heart. And so they are able to sort of have that connection. And I just have to, I told you guys this after I saw the reading, but, you know, again, not being prepped for what I was going to see. That yeah. moment when Noelle tells her story, yeah, um, and it's a musical moment, um, it, it's a difficult subject to deal with, but handled beautifully. And um, well, now I have a compliment. Okay. Um, and it's for Drew. Uh -huh. um, wow. That this and correct me if I'm wrong, Drew, because I, I, I really do want you to correct me if I'm wrong, is that story we came up with. We that story does not come from the book or the movie. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily describe in detail or in any sort of detail, uh, how Noel ended up with with cuts on her face and scars on her face. So we batted around ideas of what would be something that feels real, compelling, um, horrific, um, and something that we could really grab onto as a theatrical, you know, uh, uh, conceit. You know, the idea that it's, it, there are things that you, that you shouldn't put on stage. It's too much, it's too, it's too, and I think we, that what Drew does well with the song is it really balances this theatrical moment in a way that doesn't feel gruesome. It feels poetic, and I say that in a, I don't say that in a beautiful way. It just, the way that Drew, and I think it's one of my favorite songs Drew's ever written. And I think he, he's heard it a lot. I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly, it's one of my wife's favorite songs. Um, be, and I think it's because the subject that he tackled 
was something, in my opinion, that was nearly impossible to musicalize. And not only to musicalize it, but it comes off like poetry. Right, and when you think about that too, another subject that you wouldn't ever think would be in a musical. Sure. And right. certainly not a musical that also has so much comedy in it. Um, but that's what I'm saying is the incredible balance in this piece between some serious, heavy, life-threatening issues. Mm -hmm. And the other side of that is hilarity. And sometimes that's how we deal with those things. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and it's a learning moment for the two of them, right? Um, uh, for Noel and for Craig. Um, oh, yeah. You know, and I always, I always think uh, when I, I mean, I've only seen it once, but um, I always think, wow, I feel like this is probably the first time she's actually told another person of her age and in her world, you know, life's world, how she felt about all this and why she did what she did, you know, and, and that make gives worth to Craig, right? To say, yeah. wow, you trusted me with this. And, you know, um, well, and that, and that it's, it's, I think it's nice just, and thinking, and we, Drew and I do think of the audience when we write these shows, we, we don't, it's not an exorcism just for art's sake. We do want to put it in front of people for very specific reasons. Um, but I think watching a, 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 a high school girl have a candid conversation like that with a high school boy, and there's a no um, double entendre, it's just straight, here's what happened to me, and I need, I need you to understand this, and that it is met with understanding, is something I think tons of people of that age need to see. Yeah, I think that, and I think it, again, Drew, Drew hit it on the head, earlier. it is getting less stigmatic um, to talk about things because of the internet, and because of, you know, how, how people are being encouraged and applauded for opening up, but I still think there, it's a, we have a long way to go with people letting people know what's wrong. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I think that moment is important. I'm, I'm very excited to see that moment kind of hit with, with audiences. Those internal moments are so custom made person to person. So even though people are starting to kind of, you know, have there's support out there for like, it's okay that you're depressed. It's okay that you have anxiety. I have that too. But beyond those, uh, those words, those buzzwords that kind of come along with a lot of this, the Noel thing, the Bobby thing, the JC thing, again, it's the island of misfit toys and everybody's thing, even though there is that common thread, it is so custom made per person. Pain is a very custom design per individual. And yet one of the most helpful things is to have someone who hears you. Yes. You know, no very matter much. what your issue, problem, situation is, um, when you're not heard or you feel like you're not heard, um, it just exacerbates everything. And I think that's one of the beauties of all those relationships, Drew, you just described. People feel heard. And it's why Muktada speaks. Right. <laughs> because he feels like he's seen and heard. Well, I also um, think, you know, the, the asking of the, the question, are you okay, is something we, 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 we explore uh, in this. Uh, it, his therapist brings it up. Uh, are, Craig, are you okay? Is she, at the end, she asks him, and I find the more we've written this and the more we've thought about it, that question when people ask, are you okay? You, I, I know that nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, the person asking the question is really, really hoping you're gonna say yes, because no leads to more, more stuff and no leads to more listening. And I think a lot of people don't wanna do that. So what we've purposely done is that after this learning you know, journey, after this big, big, big sweeping five-day journey he spends in the psych ward, he gets asked the question, are you okay? And I'm very proud of the moment where he's able to say, no, yeah, I'm not. I, 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 what I've realized is I'm not, but what I've also realized, it, he says, I'm not all right, but maybe it's all right to not be all right, is that, that idea of, as, you know, as poetic as it sounds, it's very true. Like if you just kind of go like, it, both can exist. And I think right. that I think a lot of people don't think that both can exist. I'm not all right, so I should jump off the Brooklyn Bridge is the beginning of the show. At the end of the show, I'm not all right, but maybe that's all right yeah. is something that I think takes a journey sometimes. And I think it's worth the journey. Mark, yes. I got to say, I'm impressed with how much you held on to just from seeing the reading once. Me too. You've like, yeah. you, the questions you brought up are all from seeing that reading. <laughs> I was very, 
moved by your work. Well, we are very, very much really appreciate it. We're, we're, we look forward to working on it. I mean, we've yeah. been working on it. And, you know, this is the longest thing I've ever worked on. Same. Likewise. Um, and so, and, and every time we come back to it, even conversations like this, I just get so, like, inspired to keep, anytime we talk at length about this show, more stuff comes up. And immediately when I'm off this, I'm opening up a Google Doc to write some of the, th I mean, seriously, it's just, it does, it this type of source material and this type of musical is one of those things that is a joy to write in the worst way. Yeah. Um, because it is so personal and it is so, um, I think necessary to talk about. I don't like saying things are important. I'll let other people say that. I don't like saying things are important. I think everything has importance, but I think that certainly people need to see this. I'll say it, it's important. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I, uh, I look forward to working on it more with you guys and, you know, um, we, you know, Chris and I have been talking about it. It's a project we'd love to, you know, work on together. And um, I do think it's important. It's important in a lot of ways. It's bringing subject to the stage that, um, you know, needs to be discussed in as many avenues as possible to help people feel okay with not being okay. Yeah, well, we, we look for, I mean, we look forward to having it on a stage when we can have stages again. We're very excited about yeah. it. Well. Let's look forward to that, and hopefully, it might be right here at Paper Mill with all, if everything goes well, right? That'd be amazing. It happen. We would love to see it happen. Right. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining me today. It's great to see both of you, and um, open your Google Doc. Okay. Yes, I'm going to go open my Google Doc now. I'm going. I'm going okay. right now. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us here on Babbling by the Brook. Please come back next week for a preview chat about Paper Mill's upcoming, highly anticipated production of The Wanderer. We'll be talking with author Charles Messina and director Kenneth Farrell. See you then.